Welcome to Python's Eurolib request for HTTP request. In this course, you will learn how to perform basic HTTP requests with Eurolib request, explore HTTP messages and their representation in Eurolib request, go from bytes to strings, go from bytes to file, and go from bytes to dictionary. You may wonder why you'll learn how to convert bytes to strings, files, or dictionaries in this course. I won't tell you right now, but you'll soon find out when you make your very first request with Eurolib in the next lesson. The Eurolib request submodule will help you grab content from the web right out of the box with Python without using any third-party packages. Using Eurolib is also great training to work with incoming data, in this case from the web, and transforming it into a format to work with. If you're needing to make HTTP requests and want to stick to standard library Python, the Eurolib request submodule can help. To get the most out of this course, you'll have heard of HTTP requests, including Get and Post. You've also used Python to read and write to files using a context manager at least once. Now that you know what's going to be covered, let's get started. In this lesson, you'll learn how to perform basic HTTP requests with Eurolib request. Before diving deep into what an HTTP request is and how it works, you can start by making a basic GET request to a sample URL. In this case, you will make a request to example.com. You will also make a GET request to a mock REST API, such as JSON placeholder for some JSON data. First, make sure you're using Python 3 or above, then head over to your favorite code editor and open up a new file. Here I am in my code editor VS Code, and I just created a file named httpresponse.py. First, you will import URL open from Eurolib requests. Using the context manager with, you make a request and receive a response with URL open. The request will be to an example URL, in this case, www.example.com. You'll be able to find this in the content below the video. Then you read the body of the response, and the context manager you opened earlier will automatically close the connection. It is important to close the connection because keeping open can lead to slow execution and bugs. You will learn more about closing HTTP response objects in a later lesson. You then display the first 15 positions of the body to check whether the request worked and what got returned. To do so, while using the print function pass in body, then you add square brackets with colon 15 to slice the content of body at position 15. If you want to display the entire body, you can omit the square bracket notation and simply print body. You will know it worked if it looks like an HTML document. You can now move over to your terminal and run the Python script you just created. Type pi, or Python depending on your operating system, space HTTP response.py, and then press enter. As you can see, the response you got back is an HTML document. Notice the printed output of the body is preceded by B. This indicated a bytes literal, which you may need to decode. Later, you will learn how to turn bytes into a string, write them to a file, or pose them into a dictionary. In the next example, you'll make a request to JSON placeholder for some fake to-do data. In the previous example, you saw HTML as the response you got back from example.com. When you work with APIs, the response is often in JSON format. JSON placeholder offers some API endpoints to play around with when using your lib. Specifically, you'll be using their to-do's endpoint with an ID of one. You can break out your favorite code editor and jump into the code now. Remove the content from HTTP response.py and start fresh. The content will be similar, but typing it all out again will be good training. Okay, your first step is to import Eurolib request, like so. Next, you can import JSON. You will want to set the URL to the JSON data endpoint. The JSON data endpoint is the part of the URL that specifies the desired resource, such as to do slash one. Everything preceding that endpoint is the base URL. The URL will be https colon double slashes json placeholder dot typico dot com slash to do's slash one. Ensure proper closure by using the with statement and passing URL into the URL open function. Read the server's response into the body variable using the read method. Next, parse the JSON data in the body variable into a Python object using the JSON loads function. Assign the result to the variable to do item. This will be to do underscore item equals JSON loads parentheses body. And print the value of to do item using the print function. 
In the terminal, you can run your script with pi, urllib, requests, dot pi, and then hit enter. You'll get back a collection of key value pairs, such as the key user ID with the value of one and the key ID with a value of one. You also see keys like completed and title. So to recap, in this example, you import urllib request and JSON using the JSON loads function with body to decode and parse the returned JSON bytes into a Python dictionary. Now that you've got your feet wet, next you'll learn the underlying structure of HTTP messages and learn how urllib request handles them. In this lesson, you will explore HTTP messages and their representation in urllib requests. In a nutshell, an HTTP message can be understood as text transmitted as a stream of bytes. A decoded HTTP message can be as simple as get slash HTTP slash 1.1 host google.com. The first line of the message indicates the HTTP method being used. In this case, it is a get, a commonly used HTTP method to request a specific resource from a server. After the HTTP method, you can see the requested resource. In this case, it is indicated by the forward slash to represent the root directory of the website. It means that the client is requesting the default resource from the server. Following the requested resource, you have the HTTP version being used, which is the HTTP slash 1.1 in this example. After the last line is the host header. It specifies the domain name of the server the client wants to communicate with. This example shows the client is requesting the resource from www.google.com. To summarize, this specified a GET request at the root using the HTTP 1.1 protocol. The one and only header to require is the host, google.com. The target server has enough information to make a response with this. A response is similar in structure to requests. HTTP messages have two main parts, the metadata and the body. The previous example, the message is all metadata with no body. The response does have two parts. The response starts with a status line that specifies the HTTP protocol, HTTP 1.1, and the status 200 OK. After the status line, you get many key value pairs, such as server GWS, representing all the response headers. This is the metadata of the response. The blank line, also referred to as new line, at the end of the servers is a divider between the header and the body. Everything that follows the blank line makes up the body. This is the part that gets read when you're using your lib request. The main representation of an HTTP message that you'll be interacting with when using your lib request is the HTTP response object. The URL lib request module itself depends on the low level HTTP module, which you don't need to interact with directly. You do end up using some of the data structures that HTTP provide, such as HTTP response and HTTP message. When you make a request with URL request URL open, you get an HTTP response object in return. If you spend some time exploring HTTP response object with pprint and dir, you can see all the different methods and properties that belong to it. Let's jump into the code and see what that looks like. Here I am in my code editor with URL underscore request.py file open. At the top of the file, you may still have URL open imported. If not, you can do so by typing from urllib.request import url open. First, you should import pprint. pprint is pretty prints. It's another way of printing out data structures in a pretty more formatted way. Next, you're going to use url open and pass in our example website, which is example.com. as response, and then inside we want to do pprint dir response. So you will be pretty printing the response object. dir is a built-in function in Python, so it does not need to be imported. dir is used to list the attributes of an object. It returns a list of all valid attributes and methods associated with the object you pass to it. Once again, you can run the script with pi, URL lib requests dot pi and hit enter. The response object is printed out in an easy to read format. 
Within the object, you will see some key attributes, like code, which represents the status HTTP code, headers, which contains the HTTP headers as dictionary, URL, which is the URL that was requested, and a lot more. One way to inspect all the headers is to access the headers attribute of the HTTP response object. This will return an HTTP message object. You can treat an HTTP message like a dictionary by calling items on it to get all the headers and tuples. You can take a look at this in the code. Once again, you will use URL open to make a request to example.com. This time, you can use pass as a placeholder statement because the with statement requires an indented block. Next, you can access all the headers using the headers attribute. You can do pprint so that you can see all these headers in an easy to read format. Then your response object, headers, items. Let's take a look at what the terminal returns back for us. After typing pi, space urlib underscore request dot pi and hitting enter, you can now see a list of tuples where you can see a header key and the corresponding value. A few of the keys you should see are accept ranges, age, cache control, content type, and date, all the way down to connection. You probably won't need most of this information, but some applications do use it, such as your browser might use the headers to read the response, set cookies, and determine an appropriate cache lifetime. You can also call get headers directly on the HTTP response object, which will return the same list of tuples. And if you're only interested in one header, say the server header, then you can use singular get header server. Or you can use the square bracket syntax on headers from HTTP message. You can see what this looks like in the code. You can make a minor adjustment to our previous example. So where you have response headers items, you can just call one header. You can do this by doing response dot get header and then pass in server. You can take a look at the terminal to see what this returns. After typing pi space urlib underscore request dot pi and hitting enter, you'll see that it returns single quotes ECS parentheses OXR slash 830C. Another option here to return a singular header would be to leave the headers that we had before. So response.headers, square bracket, server. This will return back the exact same thing that you saw in the terminal previously. You can take a look at this now. It is unlikely you will need to interact with the headers directly like this, but now you have the tools you need to dig deeper if that needs to arise. Next up, you'll learn the importance of closing HTTP response objects. The HTTP response object has a lot in common with the file object. The HTTP response class inherits from the IO base class, as do file objects, which means that you have to be mindful of opening and closing. In simple programs, you're not likely to notice any issues if you forget to close HTTP response objects. For more complex projects, this can significantly slow execution and cause bugs that are difficult to pinpoint. Problems arise because input-output streams are limited. Each HTTP response requires a stream to be kept clear while it's being read. If you never close your streams, this will eventually prevent any other stream from being opened, and it might interfere with other programs or even your operating system. So make sure you are closed your HTTP response objects. For your convenience, you can use a context manager, as you've seen in the examples. Next lesson, you will learn how to go from bytes to string.